here he is, Thomas from Germany. What is fascinating about Thomas is that he knows the Inara school. And I'm going to ask Thomas to go and explain who the Inara school is and what is it about the German school that is different than, say, the French or the British or the American or the Middle Eastern school concerning the historical critique, because this is all to do with the historical critique. We're critiquing both Muhammad, we're critiquing the Quran, we're critiquing the origins of Islam in the 7th and 8th up until the ninth century. Can you unpack the Inara school and can you start introducing us to some of the main players in Germany, uh, some of whose names we may know, but who they did and what they uh, their work and what they have found, we don't know. Over to you. Um, next up, I'm going to introduce you to some of the main figures of, of uh, the critical Quran studies. And the three people you see on the screen right now, those are generally regarded to be the three founders of uh, modern Islamic studies. So those were the first. We have uh, on top, you see Ignaz Goldzieher. He was a Jewish-Hungarian Orientalist and scholar of Islam. He was educated at the universities of Budapest, Berlin, Leipzig, and Leiden. He went then on a journey through Syria, Palestine, and Egypt, attended lectures of Muslim sheikhs at, uh, in the mosque of Al-Azhar in Cairo. Um, and he lived disguised as a Muslim for the duration of his travel. So he really got involved to, uh, and to see the inside of, of uh, yeah. Uh, of Islam, but he remained a devout Jew throughout his life. And he is like one of the, the best resources still to this day. Um, he has written some fantastic stuff, most of it in German though. There are also some French texts from him and some Hungarian ones, but most of his work is written in German. Um, and it's definitely worth, worth uh, checking him out. Um, so next on this list, we have Theodor Nerdeke. So he was a German Orientalist, Semitist and linguist. And he's one of the people who really came from uh, like the biblical studies first. So he started out with researching um, the Old Testament, Semitic languages, Arabic, Persian, and the Syriac literature. Um, he translated several important works of Oriental literature and wrote num numerous studies, including on the Quran. Um, and then lastly, on this list of the like, three founders, we have... Um, Christian Snoke Hugronje, who is a Dutch or was a Dutch Orientalist, Arabist, and Semitist. He actually studied under Nerdeke and became a teacher of Islamic law for Dutch officials before they embarked to their colonies in Indonesia. And similar to Ignaz Goetz, he also traveled to the Middle East. He actually traveled to Mecca, um, where he disguised himself as a teacher of Islamic jurisprudence in order to study the pilgrims. And then what they, they started it off, and then pretty quickly this field was blossoming in Germany. So there were countless of, um, of names. So I, I've uh, prepared another slide here. I've only put three names on this one. I could have put 30 names on here. Because mm. it was really towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, um, this field was exploding. There was a lot of interest. A lot of people uh, flocked uh, to this field. Um, but I've picked three who will be relevant um, to what we will discuss later on. Um, so first, um, I've put here Adolf von Harnack. He was a Baltic German Lutheran theologian and prominent church historian. And he assumed a Jewish Christian origin of the Quran. So it's also sometimes known as uh, Messianic Jews. So basically, he assumed that it was Jews who wrote the Quran originally, um, Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Um, then we have David Heinrich Müller. He was a Jewish Austrian Orientalist, Semitist, linguist, and literary theorist. And he conjectured that in the Quran there was a hidden verse structure. Basically, that it, uh, there were rhymes in there hidden um, at some deeper level, deeper layer. And then lastly on this list, um, this is now the first one who wasn't part of this German school, if you will. Uh, his name is Alphonse Mingana. Uh, he was an Assyrian theologian, so he came from what's now modern-day Iraq. Back then, it would have been the Ottoman Empire. He's, he was a historian, Syriacist, Orientalist, and a former priest. Um, he's best known, actually, for collecting the Mingana, uh, 
collection of ancient Middle Eastern manuscripts at Birmingham. And the Birmingham manuscript uh, that we've just mentioned is uh, part of his collection. So he, he um, brought it to England. And but what's more important or more interesting for us later on is that he already speculated that the Quran contained Aramaic words and phrases. Um, yeah. So that will be important as we will see. Okay, now moving forward in time. Now we're going to the 1970s. And now this is obviously a big jump. So we started towards at the end of the 19th century, then uh, beginning of the 20th. And now in the 1970s, like why this big jump? Well, the thing is, even though it was a really popular field at the beginning of the 20th century, it died pretty quickly. Now, one reason was, of course, the world wars in between. So they really shut everything down. Um, but uh, another one was also that they, the scholars sort of hit a, hit a wall. So what they were used to when they studied the Bible was to having a um, etymological dictionary. So like a dictionary which contained like all the origins of every word. And that doesn't exist for, for the Quran and it still doesn't exist today. So that makes work on the Quran a lot harder than work on a Bible. Um, but by the 1970s, uh, people um, picked up again. But this time I couldn't pick, I, I couldn't show you 30 names. Um, I could maybe show you a few more than those three, but but not, not a lot. <clears throat> Okay, now first on my list here, we have uh, Günther Lüling. Um, you, you may be familiar with this name. Um, he's a, or actually may be familiar with all three of them here. But Günther Lüling, he uh, was a German theologian, philologist, Arabist, and scholar of Islam. Exactly. Uh, Jay's <laughs> showing you the book right now. This is his book. Terrible title. Don't read the title. Read this part. Let me just read what it says, because this describes what the book's really about, the undertext. And it's called The Rediscovery and reliable reconstruction of a comprehensive pre-Islamic Christian hymnal hidden in the Quran under earliest Islamic reinterpretations. He was able to go back and find strophe for strophe for strophe, Christian hymn after Christian hymn that had been taken from the Syriac and interposed into the Quran. Hugely important. And of course, we now have this in English. He changed the diacritics, the diacritical marks. So he still assumed that this was an Arab text, uh, and but was able to find uh, a lot, a lot of um, hidden verses in there. So exactly what in the previous slide. Um, so exactly what David Heinrich Miller conjectured that uh, there is a hidden verse structure there. So let, correct me if I'm wrong. He uh, one thing that Luling did. He did. He didn't use. So you're saying he didn't use the a Syriac, he actually just changed the diacritics, took the dots exactly. and put them in different places so they get different word formations. And by doing that, he was able to find strophe for strophe the different the hymns that were Christian that had been lifted yes. from the Christian hymns that were lit, that mm. were from the 5th and 6th century. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So that's what he did. So basically, because the original manuscripts don't have diacritical marks, he thought, well, uh, maybe those were put in incorrectly and he played around with them and and found Christian hymns in, in there. Um, and actually, in 1970, he uh, wrote his PhD thesis on this topic, and he got the great opus eximium, which is Latin and basically translates to outstanding work, which was the highest grade you could get back then. And it typically meant that after your PhD, you would simultaneously um, be accepted, or this, this work would simultaneously be accepted as an habilitation. So what he did was he basically re restructured his PhD thesis into the book that you just saw and um, handed it in so as, as uh, yeah, his ha habilitation. But instead of um, being accepted, he was kicked out in 1972 and his work completely ignored for decades. Okay, uh, um, that's, that's hugely important what you just said mm -hmm. there. I, I hope people are listening to uh, what Thomas is saying. He went, this is his doctoral thesis. Now, this is the English translation that we got yeah. we translated in just the last, well, I really in the last 20 to 25 years. The PhD thesis was handed in 1970. So, so 1970, maybe one year or two years before he started. Um, I don't know exactly when he started, but yeah. So in 1970, he handed in his PhD thesis and got the highest grade possible. Which um, should have been an automatic he, invitation to be a professor. 
Exactly. So it basically was a road to a tenure, uh, tenure professorship. A um, tenured professor. For those who yeah. don't know what that means, that means you cannot be fired. You, you're there for life. Yeah. But he never received it. And then he got kicked out of the university in 1972 because of what he found here? Or what was the reason? Yeah, so well, um, just uh, the, the establishment didn't like uh, what he said. So they never engaged him. They never said, oh, you're wrong. They, they um, made him look like a crank. Uh, and, and kicked him out and just ignored what he, what his book, basically. Well, there's the censorship that we are, we're seeing that we've talked mm -hmm. about many times. People who are confronting the standard Islamic narrative today, but this is in Germany, this is in Europe yeah. that he gets kicked out in a, I, I, you would assume the one place that you should be allowed to ask these kind of questions and come up with this kind of research, the fact that it was recognized so highly as the, what, the highest degree you can get in Germany proving yeah. that those who read it actually gave it, cr him credit for it, yet those in authority did not want him to receive that professorship, and he got kicked okay. out of university in 1972. Tragic when you stop to think of the implications. So really, he, he um, could have had like a very productive career, and instead he lived his life in poverty, basically, um, was dependent on welfare, uh, never got a foot back on the ground, and was completely shunned. And actually, this English translation of his book was very important because once this came out, his work was suddenly available to a wider audience. So it couldn't be ignored anymore. And it immediately received international recognition. And quickly afterwards, he was basically completely rehabilitated because um, uh, everybody who had ignored him before, they, they couldn't keep it up anymore. So they had to engage his arguments and they had to accept that, yeah, well, he has a point. He's uh, most likely correct. And uh, that so interesting. That's, that's thanks to thanks to the English translation of his book. Um, yeah. Well, we had something to do with that, and we went to meet him in 1999 in his home with his wife. I've got pictures of us there with his knickerbockers on. He was wearing his knickerbocker. <laughs> a very engaging and very, in some ways, eccentric individual. But to, I had no idea just the importance of what he had done in the 1970s, why that was not recognized, and why it is now being recognized on its credit. But yeah. his academic acumen that he was able to that he was able to put to the text itself, the Quranic text. Well, thank you. This is new. See, this is the kind of thing. These are the kind of historical background and stories that we need to hear because it is these men whose shoulders we now uh, stand on because of what they did before and before what they had before they have gone through. We can then take their material and take their findings, their research, and then run from there. So I'm encouraging everybody. The challenge to Islam for a reformation, get it, buy it. You can still get it on Amazon. It won't be there very much longer because it's going to be sold out. Uh, do make it a copy. It is quite large and start reading it and then start applying what he's saying there to what we're now finding about the Quran. Thank you so much about Gunther Luring. He's, right. He was a friend uh, before he, he's no longer living. He's now passed away, but in 2014, but he was a friend when I got to know him in 1999. Um, and next on this list are two names that, again, you uh, may be familiar with. We have John uh, Wensbro. He's an American historian and Orientalist who taught at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. And he then obviously came from a slightly different background. He was not part of this uh, German background, um, but they all moved in a similar direction. And he's the founder of the so-called Revisionist School of Islamic Studies. And, also, and most famous for um, rejecting the historical credibility of the classical Islamic narratives. Then last one on this list is uh, Patricia Krone. Uh, she was a Danish historian, orientalist, linguist, and scholar of Islam. She studied, studied under John Wensbro and was a member of the Revisionist School of Islamic Studies. She taught in Oxford, Cambridge, and Princeton. And like von Harnack, she um, conjectured that Islam has its roots in Judaism. Um, she also rejected the idea of Mecca as the cradle of Islam, which we'll also get to. Mm -hmm. And with that, now we're going to jump to today. And now here go, I've got... go back just one minute quickly to Patricia right. Krona. For those who don't know, uh, Patricia Krona came under an awful lot of censorship and an awful lot of harassment by other scholars because of her book, Hagarism. What's interesting, she rejected the theme of Hagarism, but not 
the material, not the research that she did for Hagerism. If you remember, if you get a chance to get a hold of the book, take a look. And when you open it up, you will notice that the footnotes in almost pay, every page dominate the pages. And it's those footnotes that are absolutely gold mines because she could read and write 15 languages and being able to read and write that many languages as a linguist, she was able to go back to many of the original text and just brought them into English so that we could read them. And, and that's one of the things that, that, uh, that she has not been recognized for. So here were two people, were Luling and Krohn, who were both ostracized. Krohn didn't get the ostracism that Luling got, nothing of that, mm -hmm. that nature, but very much a harassment against her conclusion in Hagarism, rather than people looking and seeing uh, the research she had done. We're doing that now for her in some ways. And this is one reason why it's so good that we have YouTube and we have people like you to come and resurrect these people and get them out to a much more popular stage and a much larger audience. So in some ways, we, we are the ones, the next generation that's going to come behind all of these great thinkers and make sure that their material gets popularized. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, and with that, let's jump to today. I know here I've presented some of the names that are in some way, shape, or form associated with this Inara group that we talked about before. Um, so not all of them are located in Saarbrücken, but they've all published for Inara, um, and are, they're all connected, basically. And I'll just go through, through them real quick. I, again, I could have put a lot more names on here. I've picked the ones that, again, I uh, that will be relevant for um, my later presentation. So first on the list is Karl-Heinz Olik. Again, he's the one who basically brought me into this uh, subject matter. He studied philosophy, Catholic theology, and history, has a PhD in Catholic theology, and he's what I call um, the great synthesizer. Right? So he's really good at um, taking two steps back, looking at what all the other people find out, and then putting it together um, to form like one coherent picture. Next on this list, we have Volker Pope. Just to let those people yeah. and see that I've underlined almost every other <laughs> sentence uh, that he wrote there. I have, there was so much, so many gems that he had just in his introduction. And then the next one you're going to show Volker Pop. He's also in this book. So if those of yeah. you who want to get this book, I would highly recommend it. The Hidden Origins of Islam. It's on Amazon.com. Yeah, um, definitely this book is a gold mine. There's a lot of good stuff in there, um, a lot of which will um, influence, or is, a lot of my presentation is uh, based on that book as well. Um, so next up, Volker Pop. He studied ethnology, African studies, Islamic studies, Turkology, and Iranian studies. He was a consultant and teacher in Turkey, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates. He was a cur curator for the creation of museum collections in Kuwait, Qatar, and Riyadh. And he's the expert on coins in this group. So if there's anything to know about coins from this period, he knows it. He's seen all the coins, um, all the cat he went through all the catalogs and 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 yeah, coin expert. <laughs> Next one, Ibn Barak. Again, probably known to a lot of people. Um, he studied Arabic and Persian in Edinburgh and London. And he taught at the University of Toulouse in France. And he's sort of the, the communicator of the group. Like he's really good at, at making what this group finds accessible. I've got three books right here. These are just, <laughs> I've got many more. I'm just going to show you quickly. I mean, there are so many books that he is credited for. And as you yeah. said, he is the one that takes everybody else's material that are no longer being published and then republishes them so that we have access to them so that we can read them. They're yeah. not necessarily, they're not his research. He's doing in some ways, what he did is what we're doing. And that is to yeah. take what others have said and then bring it down so that the whole populace can read it. So they don't get, uh, they don't become obscure because it's so important that we do acknowledge those who have gone ahead. And Ibn Warak has been the best in doing that. Yeah. Um, next one with Marcus Gross. He's a linguist. He studied phonetics, phonology, Romance studies, Indo-European studies, Oriental studies, and applied linguistics. Yeah, well, and then as you can see by this list, he's he's the one to go to if you want to dissect a text and, and analyze it in detail. Um, then we have Robert Kerr. He's a the former professor of the ancient and Near East. Um, at the Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, where he um, uh, he was uh, responsible for 
studies in languages, literatures, history, and archaeology of the ancient Near Middle East. So doing, doing a lot of stuff there. He studied Assyrology, Egyptology, Semitic studies, archaeology, classical philology, Hebrew studies, comparative religious studies. Um, yeah, as you can see, like he is a basically a check of all trades. Um, very knowledgeable guy. Then we have Johannes Thomas, professor isn't for he, Romans. Just before you go, Bea, isn't he yeah. also head of Inara? I think he's now, yeah. I think it used to be Kalans Olik, but now um, he's taking a step back, and now Robert Kerr is uh, um, basically the head of Inara. Yeah. And he is originally from Canada. I mean, he's Canadian. Actually, I'm, I'm, I think he's German. Pretty sure. Is he German? Okay, I thought since he was at Waterloo. <laughs> well, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't looked him up, but I've seen, I've seen him talk and... He talks pretty German, <laughs> and, he, and he speaks. I think actually, I saw him speak English, and it was with a German accent. So I'm pretty sure he's German. Okay. Yeah. Um, then with Johannes Thomas, professor for Romance literature and Roman studies, and he's the expert on Muslim Spain. Um, if Gerd Puin, again another big name here. Um, his background is again in Islamic studies. He wrote his PhD on early Islamic governance. He spent a year at the University of Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and teaches Oriental Studies at the University of Sepulchre. Um, and he, he's made basically most famous for um, his being responsible for the restoration and the cataloging of the Sana manuscripts. Yeah. So he spent his uh, like he spent four years in in Yemen from 1981 to 1985. He was the first scholar to look at those manuscripts, which um, are some of the oldest manuscripts um, of the Quran that, that we know of. And also the only ones that are not part, not uh, of the Uthmanic text type. Right. Okay. Now, just to be yeah. clear, it's, it, both he and his wife, who all, has a yes. doctorate as well, Elizabeth Quinn, yes. are, they, were, they have been working on the Sana'a manuscript and have come up with quite a, quite a few very controversial conclusions that many Muslims do not care for. But uh, you, you have to give him credit. He certainly he's been working on this. Well, so you're talking about for 40 years now, going on to 40 years. Yeah, yeah. So that was definitely some very important work. I don't think anybody has, since has looked at those manuscripts again, at least from a scholarly perspective. Um, well, we, we do we have, have we do excuse me real quickly. We do have Asma Halali, this book here. The Sanaa yeah. Paul says, I don't know if people would call this a scholarly look, and I think you're correct, Thomas. Yeah. This is rather a populist look at the Sanaa, and she has been criticized by, uh, by a lot of scholars because she didn't really do what Gerd Prynne has done or that his wife has done. And you can see this is more of an apologetic, a, a, a very apologetic reference book on, on the Sanaa manuscript. But this is the first one that's in print in English. You have yeah. Gerd Prynne in Germany. I wish we could have him in English. So that we can get his, also, he's been yeah, working maybe, much for it. Maybe to clarify what I meant is nobody has physically looked at those documents and, and examined them, right? So, I mean, of course, there, were, there are always people who basically take that point's work and, and build upon it. Like, um, but as far as I know, not all of the manuscripts that they found in Sana'a um, had been catalogued and analyzed, and nobody has done that since uh, Gat Puyn was down there. Yeah. And you have also Sedege and Gudarzi. I think that's the, that's the way you pronounce it. They have also looked at the Sana, but no, I don't think, as you're right, nobody has the stature of Quinn when it comes to that. Okay. And then um, next on this list, we have Geneviève Gobillot. Now she is French, as the name implies, and she's professor for Arabic and Islamic studies in Lyon in France. Her main fields of study are Islamic mysticism and its connection to Neoplatonism. Uh, as well as some spiritual currents among the Shia, comparing Islamic spirituality, spirituality with that of other religions and theories on the question of the sacred. And then one of the younger people on his list is Marcin Grotsky. He's an Arabist and Islam, Islamic, Islamic uh, professor of Islamic studies at the University of Warsaw in Poland. And then last on this list, um, with a big question mark, is Christoph Luxemburg, and 
Actually, he is the one I want to focus a bit more on. Exactly, Jay already holding up his book. This is the book. Right, actually, done so uh, much damage, and this is why I'm so glad you've come to help us out because we need someone to, uh, like you, Thomas, who has read it, understands it, and can unpack it for us. And we're going to do a whole video just on his findings. But I'm so glad you brought it. And the reason you have a question mark is we don't have any picture of him. Exactly. So he's he's uh, uh, publishing under a pseudonym. Um, Actually, I've got a whole slide reserved for him because he's going to be important in the, uh, in the next video we're doing. So, yeah, so Christoph Luxemburg published under a pseudonym. Um, does want to be recognized. He's a specialist on Semitic philology. He taught classical Arab and several Arab dialects, as well as Syriac at German universities. And he's an expert on translations. And with his book, which you've just seen, um, he broke new ground um, in, because he showed that the Quran contains Aramaic words and phrases. So this is also what also uh, already Alphonse, Alphonse Mignana um, hypothesized, and he also had some some good evidence for it. But he didn't have like a a proper let's say um, methodology to accessing it. Um, and Christoph Luxemburg developed that. Um, now, and am I, am I uh, correct sorry? in believing that he has been ostracized as well? Um, of course, of course. So, um, <laughs> as with everybody who brings something new to the table, the first reaction is always um, oh, the, uh, skepticism and 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 rejection. Um, with him, basically, can you can see that there are criticisms coming from two sides. On the one side are, are Muslim scholars. What they typically do is they. Um, they, they sort of either they completely misrepresent him, like they just um, sort of build up a straw man and then try to destroy that one, or they try to nitpick. So, I mean, as with everybody, sometimes it's not um, clear that whether he's in one specific place, right or wrong. Maybe he made a mistake. That, that, that sort of thing happens. And what uh, Muslims try to do is like to try to nitpick to find um, like one instance where you could argue, well, maybe it's not correct and then ignore everything else, <laughs> basically. Um, but on the other side, we also have criticism from, from the, let's say, established mainstream university um, area. But what they're doing is similar to what they did with Luling. They, they don't engage him on his, on his core arguments they're saying things like, what you're doing is not helpful. Like, or um, we're going to invite Muslims to have a dialogue. And, and with your book, you're, you're um, making that impossible, that sort of thing, which I guess is fair enough. But that's not what uh, um, yeah, scholarship should be like, right? This is no longer looking for the truth. This is now looking for some uh, uh, something else, like for <laughs> friendship between the faiths or whatever you want to call it, but not looking for the truth anymore. Isn't but that there's nobody who's really engaging him on his on his arguments. Isn't that interesting that Thomas that we are here is two examples that you've given me actually three, Luling, mm. Patricia Corona, and now here with uh, Christoph Luxemburg. In all three cases, they came up with original work, which in the university system should be the place that original work is discussed. Can you imagine that this if this would have happened in biblical studies? It is because of the German school that we have historical criticism applied on the Bible in the 1800s, Wellhausen and the whole Tübingen mm -hmm. school and the documentary hypothesis and all these different didactic found, uh, source criticism, the textual criticism of the Bible has been vibrant there in Germany. Why are the same criticisms not applied to the crown? Or let me just put it this way. When they are applied to the crown, what suddenly is this shutdown or censorship of the very people who are applying what was earlier applied to the Bible now cannot be applied to the Quran? Why do you think there is this, uh, this, uh, uh, this double standard or in your, in uh, at least what I consider um, double standard? Yeah, I guess there are, probably two sides to this one is most likely fear i guess i mean we've seen what happened with the cartoonists in denmark uh, I, and I, I mean obviously that's also the reason why christoph luxemburg isn't publishing under his real name um so i guess that's probably one reason another one i could see is um sort of like 
almost this racist notion of uh, the noble savage, right? So they they see Islam sort of in this idealized romantic light, which I think is uh, blatantly racist, but they think it's like the right thing to do, obviously. Um, but I think those two co maybe come together. So they want to see Islam in a good light, but at the same time, they're afraid of Islam. So, if, and, and, uh, so they better not, they don't want to engage um, any of any of the material that could be controversial. So because of the fear of, is of Muslims, of what mm. might happen if their name gets attached to their research, mm. They ennoble the they ennoble the Arab the the Arab text and they don't they. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if that's because they're afraid. I, I'm I'm just feeling those are two currents that are going on. Whether they are related or not, I can't say. But I think both both is going on at the same time. Um, yeah. Can I suggest a third option? Yeah. And this is something that was brought home to me by Patricia Corona herself. And that is almost every one of these departments. I'm sure it's the case in Germany. It's certainly the case in Britain. Any of these Near Eastern departments are dependent on finances coming in from Saudi Arabia or from Qatar or from Bahrain, these, in, these countries. And for in order for them, in, in the case of uh, SOAS, even from the Sultan of Brunei, who created, who built a $10 million building there on the campus for the school, but with every, with all those dollars coming in from these institutions, there is also the understanding that the that those institutions must not be critical, certainly at, at a base level. And that's why, while I was there at SOAS, Dr. Gerald Hotting was the last teacher to teach John Wanderer's material and the revisionist group, uh, whole theory. And I don't know of anybody that's taken up from there. And I would suggest that maybe an awful lot of these scholars know where the money comes from. And they're fearful that if they do come out with this and go public with it, all their funding will be cut off, not just their funding, but also the institution. Patricia Corona said this to my face when I asked her to do the debate for me. I said, you know it so much better. Why aren't you doing it? She says, because I have a chair to protect and I have an institution that I represent and I dare not confront both the institution or the chair. And I said, well, that is tragic. Uh, so if that is the case, then I would suggest uh, this is a real problem because of we have allowed in our Western universities to the Muslims to now fund them and fund these departments. That, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, although I, this, I feel like, at least in Germany, the mainstream is now slowly picking up on what Christoph Luxemburg has said. They're still publicly, um, they don't want to have anything to do with it. They're sort of, if they're not outright denouncing him, they're ignoring him. But when you look at what they're doing, um, while they're sort of denouncing looks like they're doing very similar things now. So I, I feel like he, um, his methodology is slowly taking hold. Um, and I hope, I hope that uh, more will come, will come of it. Yeah. Okay, and so this is this is this was the last slide for today. Um, but before we end this, uh, I would like to give you a little story about Christoph Luxemburg, uh, in particularly about and particularly about his PhD thesis, which was on a ninth-century Syriac manuscript that refers to earlier Greek texts from the fifth and sixth centuries. Mm -hmm. um, so in his work, he discussed homilies, among them the homily of Jacob of Saruk, and according to Ibn Barak, he was able to give a fuller description than hitherto. But his main task was to identify the Syriac texts in the 9th century manuscripts with the help of the original Greek manuscripts. And that turned out to be a really difficult task because back then, translations were extremely literal to the point where they were almost unreadable. Um, so you can imagine kind of like if you go to a foreign language website and you let it run through uh, Google Translate, you oftentimes get elements of this page which are very literal and don't make much sense in English. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of what you had to deal with, but not with uh, any modern language, but with uh, Syriac and ancient Greek. So he thereby acquired important insights. That, had, that led him to develop a method that he was then later able to apply to the understanding of uh, the Quran. Um, so in this Syriac manuscript, he tried to identify the fragments and the authors, um, which were both previously unknown, by comparing the Ar Aramaic manuscript with the original unedited Greek texts. And he got copies of Greek manuscripts from all over Europe, from libraries and universities. And painstaking work found all the sources except for one. 
Uh, in this one instance, the original Greek had been lost, uh, or the Greek manuscript had been lost, um, which happens, obviously. So then, based on the writing style of the Syriac translation, the abridged Syriac translation, <laughs> as well as the subject matter, Luxembourg was able to identify Severus of Antioch as the author. And indeed, years later, a Jesuit scholar from Rome discovered a manuscript in Damascus, which confirmed Luxembourg's conjecture. So that's the kind of genius we're dealing here with. Um, so he's looking at a Syriac translation, a abridged Syriac translation of an old, uh, old ancient Greek text, and he was able to identify the author. Um, when I read this, I thought, well, this, this is mind-blowing stuff. Um, and next time, we'll see what happens when this mind goes to work on the Quran. Terrific stuff. Hey, listen, so this has been good as an introduction. This is an introduction to our good friend Thomas uh, Alexander, who has agreed to come on board. He has been inter uh, introduced to me on the Internet to begin with on YouTube as one of the commentator commenters, like many of you are commenters, and has had this unique ability to not only understand the Inara school, the German school, but to communicate it in brilliant English. You've got your English is just impeccable. Uh, Thank you. You, you, for a lot of Germans who I come across, they don't speak near as well as you do. But the nice thing about it is you understand the material that you're communicating. And that's what we need. And it, we're, we're all thanking you for coming and helping us out in this area. Now, you've gone through and you introduced the Anada School, uh, the School of Enlightenment that, the, uh, that has really been the school that I would suggest, say would be the German revisionist school, for lack of a yeah. better word, title. Uh, you're looking and you're saying that they're the... They, the history of Islam has been told by the traditions is not trusted anymore. It is too late and too far north. And so you're saying, let's go back and let's see what history is telling us. In this case, you're looking at the Quran. And this, this is fascinating. Yeah. We start with the Quran. You'll be going to other areas later on. But we're starting with the Quran. And your scholars have really been the best. I don't know of anybody else that has, has done as much germinal work as the German scholars have on the Quran, including Oleg and Heinz al Oleg and also Gerd Puin and others. But you're, what was fascinating is you've gone through and you've showed three different groups the founders, the first three founders, and then another group, the subgroup, mm. but then the more modern scholars that are now engaging in our lifetime. And those who have mm. gone before have paved the way for those who have come after, and those who are now paving the way for those like you and me, who then can take it and now bring it into a much more populist area. We are not writing books. We're not waiting for peer review to take years to, to uh, Follow, find its course, we're getting and putting it up on YouTube where we get peer reviewed within seconds. You're going to get peer reviewed yeah. within seconds. You'll see that by the comments as soon as this goes up. And, the, and, and that is really where we need to go with this. We need to bring the German school into the English speaking world. Uh, you gave the example of Luling. Once we got Luling's book translated into English, and I tell you, this was hard to translate because the translators that we got to, to actually translate this, they came back to us and said, we some of his sentences are 400 words long. <laughs> I don't know if that's typically German, if Germans do that anyways, but in his case, that is, that is typical, yeah. <laughs> typical? Well, I, I, and what they were telling me is we started with the sentence. We, by the time we got to the end of the sentence, we weren't even sure what, the, what we had said in the first part of the sentence. They had lost the, the thread. He was very difficult to translate. And that's why I think people, we need to hear what these, what these scholars in Germany have been saying, what they've been studying, and what they've been writing, but what has been, what has been kept in academic ivory towers. We need to take them out of those towers, bring them down to layman's terminology. That's what you're doing. That's what I'm doing. And unpack it so that we can benefit from it, and so that these people get a much wider hearing. So it's not just the German-speaking world. Now the whole English-speaking world is going to hear about their findings. That's, bit, that's so important that we have you on, Thomas, to do that. Now, in the next episode that we're going to go right on from, you're going to unpack Christoph Luxemburg. You're going to be unpacking this book especially because this is hugely important, what he has found. So let's go ahead and get right into it, folks. Meanwhile, listen to what Thomas has said. React.
you've got the comments down here. Make sure you react. Thomas is going to be looking at the comments and he's going to try to answer, but there are some comments that will probably need further videos for us to unpack. So I'm going to ask Thomas to do that. Look at some of those comments, grab the ones you think are really need to be answered, and we'll probably come back and we'll probably give you ref, uh, other videos. I've been doing this with Mel. I've been doing it with Odon. We do this purposely because it's important that they then react to what you're critiquing. Others of you want to support what he's saying. You may find other areas that he's missed that he you may need he may need help on. Write it. Give us other articles that we've missed, other areas that maybe uh, are other anecdotes that we could use. But be careful. We do not want any trolling here. We don't want people just sitting there and yelling and calling us names or calling Thomas names. Make sure that what you write helps the discussion and carries on the discussion because that's what we're all about. And so we will get back to you if we think that this is a, a worthy comment or a worthy question that needs an answer. Anyhow, until the next video, this is Thomas in Germany, me here in the United States, over oh, almost 4,000 miles apart, over and out. <laughs>